and down. Or maybe you just angle it different. Is it recording? It's recording. It's, it's broadcasting now. It's broadcasting Yeah. Now. Usually when I've done this before, we wait a couple of minutes because sometimes it takes people a little while to like show up and make themselves known. I mean, um, that seems reasonable to me. I don't know how we tell. Okay. It says that this is up. Oh, I see. Two people are watching. Hey, it's Mike uh -huh. and Chris. <laughs> Those two people aren't us watching. Okay, good, good. good. Hello. So, okay. I am going to figure out how to turn that light down a little bit. Since we have the front light. She's figuring out the light. Well, not all the way off. Now we won't be able to see. Ah. Ah. Now I'm blind. I can't even see the screen. Maybe we can. This is Aaron's secret writing studio. <laughs> it's my writing. It's like a little den here in the wilds of Washington State. I guess nobody's going to stop watching because there's this bright light. Probably. Everyone you can give seems me a minute because I can't actually. S I looked at that light bulb and now I can't see the screen. Okay. So you have 21 people. Hello. Okay. Everyone. You can, everybody can see in here. That's awesome. Okay. So we can just start and people as they trickle in. So if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them. We'll scroll back and check them out. Um, but hi, I'm Erin M. Evans. I am best known for writing the Brimstone Angels Saga for Forgotten Realms. And I'm here today to interview Eric Spectabee. That's me. I am um, best known for writing other realm stuff, including the Shadowbane series. Ghostwalker, Depths of Madness, and a bunch of game design stuff. Neverwinter Never Winter. campaign guide. Yeah, it's all fun. And he is also uh, the DM for our upcoming streaming game as the Dungeon Scrawlers. Um, uh, running our adventure is called the Westgate Irregulars. Right. So, first question. Look how prepared I am. She's very prepared, everyone. You can see the notes. This whole thing is your fault. What made you want to start a streaming show featuring writers? You know, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am, I am going to shove Stephen all the way under the bus here. And uh, Stephen Merlino is another one of our players. And it was actually his idea for us to do a streaming thing because he saw the success of Critical Role and, uh, and other such streaming platforms and said, hey, I want to do one of those. And secondarily, hey, there are writers in the area who are really creative, and wouldn't it be cool to have a stream composed of fantasy writers? And so that's what we are. We're the Dungeon Scrollers. Uh, all of us are fantasy writers and game designers, and we have come together to flex our cumulative creative might <laughs> in um, this fun campaign. And uh, he approached me basically out of the blue. We didn't know each other. You didn't know each other? No. <laughs> <laughs> we might we might have crossed paths once upon a time or that's... like in, exchanged emails or something. So fun fact about Eric, I feel like every time I meet a new react writer in Seattle, and we are thick on the ground here, science fiction fantasy writers in Seattle, um, I meet them and then I like they send me a Facebook friend request and I'm like, cool, and it says, you have these mutual friends. And it is always oh, Eric. I don't know how he meets everybody, but Eric knows everybody. So it doesn't surprise it surprises me more that Steven didn't know you better. Um, but it also doesn't surprise me that Stephen, that, that this is the connection, right? Well, I was apparently his second choice. Now, don't, <laughs> don't hold that against him, okay? It's all right. He, he made the right choice eventually. But... You, you just took it and you're like, give me this, I'll fix it. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe when Aaron interviews Stephen, she can ask him and like, do, do a little gotcha journalism there. But the, the thing is, um, he approached me and he said, oh, yeah, how would you like to do this? And I said, well, obviously, I'll run my Westgate game. That's great. I've been working on this whole idea for the last several years. Some of you may have been following me. Uh, I keep talking about, hey, you know, this Westgate supplement's going to come out. It's going to be great. I'm working on it right now. Yeah, that's been going on for a while. I, I, I do it in the background of all my other work and stuff. But this really gives me some impetus to develop it alongside playing a campaign in that setting. So that's the idea. And that product, which is called the Westgate Campaign Guide, is the name I'm going with right now, should be available on the Guild 
whenever it's available on the <laughs> guild. When we're done with it. Well, it needs to have it needs to be fully written. It needs to have art. It needs to have good layout. It needs to have a decent production value because you know you're worth it. Um, so I did see a question on here that is related to what I just asked you, which uh -oh. is how many of us are there? How many people are playing in this game? All of them. All no, of the there are seven of us playing in the game, including myself. The DM is, of course, a player. You have me. I'm the phone. You have Aaron. That's here. weird. I feel like you should be the tallest one. But okay, you're the I, Okay, <laughs> well, and Steven. And then we have Yang Yang Wang, who is a, uh, a brilliant. Uh, writer and kind of our tech guy. He, and an uh, actor. And an actor, and he knows things about film that are fantastic, so he's going to be there. He's going to make sure that this doesn't look ridiculous. Yeah, like it's it does right amazing. now. Amazing. If he were here, he, I, he'd be telling me, don't count on your fingers like that. It's weird. He and would awkward. know how to fix the light. Yeah. So when I interview Yang Yang, he'll be like, Yang Yang, light. fix the light. Please. please <laughs> And then there's Rhiannon Held, who is a friend of Aaron's and of mine, a uh, local See author. See previous comment. I had no idea Eric knew Rhiannon. Uh, she writes a, a fantastic urban fantasy, kind of an indie author. You should definitely check out her stuff. She has this great perspective. And there's uh, Emily Tang, who works at Wizards. She works on the Magic team, actually. Um, and, Randy. And then there's also Randy Henderson, who is... Uh, a pretty well-established fantasy author. He is the author of the Finn Fancy Necromancy series, which is, so fun which is this uh, kind of 80s-infused urban fantasy uh, delighting in Portland and Seattle and the Pacific Northwest. This is real good. I highly recommend it. There will be links in the description if we get around to it. And we will probably have giveaways just as a heads up. That's one of the things we're going to do on the stream because we're writers and what do we do? We produce books and we want the, you to read them. Um, so here's a question. What do you think um, all of us being writers brings to the game? You know, like what, how does that differ than watching just a bunch of people who are really passionate about playing? Like, does it change things? Do you feel like it's, you know, just an extra bump of creativity or is there mm -hmm. something more complex about that? Well, I think that we have a certain amount of, instinct for narrative and we have less compunction or hesitation about putting our characters in interesting difficult situations a lot of gamers in my long experience running games are very hesitant about like oh my character is going to fail doing this or i don't want my character to do something that's going to make them look silly or wrong or or mess up and at our table people are like Let's do it. <laughs> let's see what happens. And let's We might be fond of characters to make bad choices to create interesting narrative. Speaking of that, you know, Erin's going to tell you about her character eventually. Yeah, and, sure. well, if you've read any of Erin's books, you probably have a sense about where this is going to go. Oh, no. Let's just be clear. <laughs> Cecilia and Frida, they're not alike. Not at all Except alike. potentially in the part. I think, I think Frida makes the best choice out of a bunch of bad options. And Cecilia goes, F all this. That one's easy. I'm going to make and, the uh, easy choice, which is not... Usually the best choice, yeah. But <laughs> also, also it should be pointed out that Farida is a warlock, and Cecilia is definitely a witch. Not a definitely not definitely a warlock. Not. Definitely not a warlock <laughs> bound to a chthonic fey entity. No. no, no, that's a dirty lie, filthy, dirty lie. Probably spread by enchanters. Or that Wilton jackass. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> okay, so um, I did see it pop up, and so we will pop to this. Um, so, the, like you said, the game we're playing is sort of based on material from Westgate campaign guide that you've been working on. That's right. Um, Westgate also appears a lot in your novels. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it about Westgate? What makes you want to write about Westgate? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, I really liked Azure Bonds when I was a kid. I liked the game. I liked the book. I like Jeff Grubb. All right, that, that's only tangentially related. <laughs> um, but I, I liked the, the feel of this kind of thieves city of uh, a place where everything has a price, either in blood or in coin or in both. And all sorts of intrigues are happening all the time. Ruled over by corrupt oligarchs. <clears throat> it's not a social commentary on our modern political situation <laughs> or anything. Um, but 
I like the potential of Westgate. I like the moral ambiguity. We're not a shining bastion, but we're not strictly like an evil dental keep sort of place either. So it could go either way. It's a perfect place for adventurers. And I've written one novel set in Westgate, some other fiction kind of related to Westgate. And I just, something about it. Also, it's not one of the cities in the realms that's particularly well developed. Like, there was an entry on it in Cloak and Dagger. It talked about it a great deal. And I, I mined that uh, very, very deeply for my novel, Chad of Bane, Eye of Justice, which actually takes place in Westgate, and also for this uh, game. The problem is um, Cloak and Dagger is set in the 1360s and 1370s, and that's 100 years ago based on where our campaign is happening, based on where I was writing my novel. So things have evolved from then. And it gave me this great opportunity to kind of um, reassess how the city would have developed over that period of time. And uh, it's, I think you're gonna like it. It's pretty great, but it also holds true to that really great product. So you have Realms novels set in Westgate mm -hmm. and around Westgate, and also this game. Um, how much have your novels influenced the game? Oh, a lot. <laughs> now you're going to see familiar faces this that is show a little up. Bit of a gimme. Yeah, you're going to you're going to see familiar faces showing up in the game. You're going to see some plot points that I might have kind of left hanging <laughs> that influence the game. It should be noted that our campaign is set in the early 1490s, which is 12, 15 years after Shadowbane Eye of Justice. So everything that happened in that novel is in the backstory of the campaign. And you see how things have developed and moved on from there. Um, so what do you think, what are, what are some ways that it's different writing a novel versus writing a source book or game supplement? Because you see a lot of times people um, sort of talk about them because they're both creative and they're both involved sort of role building and character building and plot. But, um, but my experience is they're not the same. Hmm. But I have way less experience with the game writing part of it. So what do you think are some differences between the two? Well, I think you're, you're fundamentally delivering a different experience. Um, with a novel, you're delivering a very specific, very, very straight story that you're asking your reader to come along on. And it could be a very twisty and complicated and deep story, but it is ultimately totally under your control as the author. When you're doing a game supplement, however, you're producing well, you're, you're basically giving them a bunch of research and information that they can use to produce their own story. And their own story might be radically different from what you ever could have intended or dreamed up. This is part of, um, this is, this is, this is a, a thing that is very much thematic to the realms. When Ed Greenwood originally created the realms and he originally sold it to TSR to develop, he did so because he wanted to see other people's visions and other people's ideas coming in to develop his setting. And that's kind of what I'm doing with our campaign. I want I wanted to mine the rest of you, creative, excellent, <laughs> thoughtful, narratively focused people, to get some ideas for developing my product. And I think, I think it, will, it will pay off good dividends. Sounds good. Also, your characters are great. <laughs> so. so we did have someone ask about if we have developed our characters yet. Um, and so one thing you should know is that we have been playing this game for a while. Um, we, you know, sort of, but when, Eric has broken When it she says parts. a while, we've been playing it for almost a year now. <laughs> so... We, with some gaps. With, with some, some gaps, gaps, yeah. We didn't we, much play over this number. That's true. We, we know our characters pretty well. We sort of know how they fit together. Yeah. Um, or I should say, they know their characters pretty well. I have a good sense of their characters. <laughs> we have to remind you occasionally. <laughs> and, um, and, but it has given me a great source of knowledge for how to challenge them and engage them and involve them. And I, I'll give you an example. Basically, when I'm dealing with Set Celia, any NPC that I put in her path, she is automatically going to distrust. Con knows a con! <laughs> see? See? <laughs> Particularly if they are intelligent, charismatic, or oh, yeah. conniving. If they start, start turning on the charm, that's a tell. And so, and They're so, trying to get us to do something. That's right. Uh, Cecilia doesn't do things. 
there might be re there might be reference to this in the game, but um, if anyone has read my my Shadow Bane novels or they read Depths of Madness and they're familiar with my character <laughs> Fox at Twilight, yes, Illyrian Athlon, Fox at Twilight, she stabbed Cecilia and left her to die on a mountainside. That is how you prickly Cecilia can be. She better watch out. That's all I'm saying. I know they're nemesis. <laughs> They're, they're, I don't care how much higher level she is. It's, it's like she's not I'm that much it. higher level than you. It's so much. <laughs> she stabbed me. They are, they are, I just asked a question. They are both chaotic neutral, and they're nemeses, and it's great. I think Cecilia likes Mirren now, though. Oh, who doesn't like Mirren? Yeah, she's pretty adorable. Everyone likes Mirren. That's part I of Mirren's problem. I think originally she's like, "What's your game?" <laughs> <laughs> but now. Okay, so we've been playing for a while. So so that means we do have some um, sort of stories to uh, to tell. There's a lot more. This is not loading all the new comments. Oh, oh wow. Yes. Sorry, yeah, we, guys. We, we, I weren't, thought, we I, weren't scrolling down, so sorry. I thought you so guys sorry. were just sort of like enraptured and not, not asking questions. So I'll, I'll skim it. Um, I do, I so do what level are we starting sometimes. for the show? We are starting, I think we're level like five? We're level, level five, five right now. They we're started at level one, but there was a thing with a deck of many things, and <laughs> they all went to level three real fast. That's yeah, great. <laughs> so, it's like the only time the deck of many things ever fade off. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you weren't the one who got cursed by it, so. Uh, there was a question. I think it got answered. Will Shadowbane or Fox at Twilight be NPCs? Yes. yes. Also some other people. One of them will show up in the first session, in fact. News to me. Well, one of them showed up in the first Better session when we actually started playing, so. I don't, oh, I guess it, it, oh, 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 oh. Gonna get my, gonna get my, my, my magic. Witch, witch, not warlock blade. Sure. Right. Okay. Um, so while I look and see if people have questions yes. that fit nicely into what we're talking about, mm -hmm. I was going to say, do you have any stories about, you know, our first arc of the game? The where you were really challenged as a DM, or you're like a flex as a DM, or something really surprising happened that you enjoyed. Like, you you tell the good people. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna tell you a couple of my favorite stories from our game. Um, one of them involved an overland trek. They the characters have met, and you're going to meet as well. This very perky uh, dwarf prospector. Her name is Narcy. And uh, she rides a, a giant, what was it, badger, weasel, something like that. It's a, it's a it's a like a dire badger is her mount, and she's a ranger, okay, um, but like a original PHB ranger that's mostly focused on overland exploration and such, not combat. What are you talking about? Um, and so <laughs> Yang Yang is in the chat, so he can yell at us about our lighting. Later. Right, one of our one of our players, <laughs> Yang Yang Wang, is there. Um, Hi, Yang Yang. Probably the sound, too, because we're just using my laptop. So they're on that's the, okay. They're we're on friends. We're overland, friends here. Yeah, they're on this overland trek, and they're going to find this crypt that Narcy has heard rumor of. And they find an ogre guarding this crypt. Um, and I figured, okay, they're third-level characters. They're just going to fight this ogre. It's going to be fine. So immediately they befriend the ogre, <laughs> and they convince the ogre to... <laughs> to stand guard over the crypt while they go down into the crypt. And what happens in the crypt is very, you know, uh, Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, Barrow Whites coming out and attacking them and they fight the Whites off. And then they hear battle going on up above. And they're like, what's up? What's wrong? Not, we're in danger. It's, oh no, our ogre friend is in danger. <laughs> and so they run back up and they find the ogre that they had befriended and turned into a guard being murdered by this other band of adventurers who has come to pillage the same crypt. And they confront them, and they try and talk them down, and it turns into a fight, and the war cry that Stong, who is Yang Yang's character, uh, shouts, has to do with avenging the ogre. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that, was, that was one of my favorite things. Talk about moral ambiguity, right? And the other one is a situation where I did not expect it to be as technically or mechanically difficult as it was, but it ended up being going that way. They found this ancient uh, temple under Westgate, and it's a temple to, well, they didn't know at the time, it was obviously a temple to Shar, okay? Right. And Sometimes these things happen, and I have to pretend I don't know anything because Cecilia doesn't right. pay attention to 
Evans. Right. Bitch. Aaron Evans, huge amount of realms lore. Cecilia, winging it 100%. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, she's from Rashomon. She's like, you weird gods. Like, so they find this underground temple. And there are a lot of moving parts to this temple. There's a, there's a statue of this, you know, woman made of black stone holding a bowl full of some liquid that might be blood, who knows, and a purple flame. And there's a summoning circle. And there's a, a series of crypts that are uh, broken into the wall on the other side. And um, all the PCs just disperse to go look at these things like, we're going to go make our arcana checks. We're going to make our religion checks, figure out what these things are. The rogue in the party, this is Sturge, who is uh, it's Steven. Steven's character. Uh, he has a big, long nose. He's an arcane trickster. He says, hmm, I'm going to go lurk in the shadows, like Sturge usually does. He's a very in character does. for Sturge. So he goes and um, he lurks in the shadows like this, right? Just exactly. Just exactly like this. But with him. And so Rhiannon's character, uh, Artemisia, who is actually Cecilia's half sister, is it, it's complicated. It's not that complicated. It, Our mom got around. Yeah, that. that For I guess it's a shorter story than I thought. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's looking at the summoning circle, making her arcana checks, and she sees Sturge coming toward her like, like this. Not not moving his legs, just kind of like floating toward her, and again. This is quite in character for Sturge. This <laughs> like doing things to freak people out is a thing it's that so, Sturge does. It's so creepy and it's not clear ever if he knows he's doing it. I, I don't think he intends to. <laughs> I, don't wanna, I don't want to I don't want to prejudice you guys. Sturge has made a great deal of progress. Okay, but he's coming out of the shadows. He's like and Artemisia is like, Sturge, what are you doing? And then it come uh, he comes into the light and Artemisia realizes that he's inside a gelatinous cube that's coming toward her. <laughs> And I say, okay, roll initiative, and all the players roll really low. Terrible. And so the, the cube just comes and just swallows Artemisia and then just keeps going on. <laughs> and it encounters the players basically one by one. <laughs> and at one point it had three different people in it, including Song, who had jumped into the cube in an effort to push <laughs> Artemisia out of the cube. And he rolled a one, and so he ended up inside the cube as well. And to just paint this picture fully, Stong is our bard, our half-orc bard. That's right. Who has a strength of 20 and a charisma of 8. 8. He's, He's a strength bard. delightful. Yes. Um, and Artemisia is a half-elf sorceress, who mm -hmm. I, I want to say her strength is 6. 6. It, she is frail. That's right. So he leaps like into she, the she, she fell several times trying to climb <laughs> up and down and not a rope, so... He leaps into this cube to push this tiny half-elf woman out and just... Uh, in the cube. And of course, I was using minis, so I used, you know, a dice container. So I just put all the minis in the dice container, and then I'm moving it around the board. And the only one who was never inside the cube was Cecilia, because she kept running away from I'm it not getting in there. and Eldritch blasting it. I mean, until it finally. <laughs> All Finally witches started. from Rashomon do Eldritch Blast. Did you know that? That's, That's right. That's a fun realm That's fact right. from it's Cecilia. A very common mm -hmm. witch power. Yep. Yeah. Have you been to Rashomon? Then you don't know. And I want to point this out. <laughs> Jelana Steve is a CR2 monster. They are third level <laughs> characters. There are six third level characters in that room. Well, I think there are only five because I don't I don't think uh, Emily was there that evening. But <laughs> whole party. <laughs> One CR2 monster. Well, it does like 6d6 acid damage to anything inside it, which is brutal when the characters only have like 18 or 19 hit points. <laughs> Nobody could get out. Nobody could get out of the cube. It was all on Cecilia to blast it apart, which she finally <laughs> did. And it has remained an ongoing uh, joke, I guess, uh, like a legacy for the party yes. in the form of Artemisia's familiar. Which is named Roomba. It's this it's tiny gelatinous little gelatinous cube. cube that keeps her ba her basement queen. Yes, it lives in the cellar. <laughs> Occasionally, uh, Randy's character is Rogoth. He's a, or Rogar, Rogar. Rogar. Sorry, Rogar. He's a uh, he's a dwarf. He wears um, mithril armor, just fully covered armor. Occasionally, he'll take naps in the in the cellar, and he'll wake up, and his armor will be totally clean. <laughs> And you'll have no idea what it was, but it was probably the sleep rats. So <laughs> I wonder if so there's 
like there's space stuff that's made out of snail mucus because apparently it's really good. I wonder if in the realms they do sperm. like yeah, it's like a like a peel. You let little tiny gelatinous peels crawl in your face. Look, I don't want to say she should... no. Like you should definitely. I don't know why Armesia, I don't know why Armesia hasn't monetized this so far. I don't know. Now I'm like maybe it's, it's going to be like discount facials. Come to our house and she... just be like <laughs> stick room behind your face. I mean, that's she, 50 gold. It's very high end. Yeah, Artemisia is heavily involved in the uh, Purple Lady and in the uh, Silks at Dawn Salon in Westgate, and she could offer those kind of services. That's so true. But she might need a little ruthlessness to think of it. That's where Cecilia comes in. Um, okay, so I have a list of silly questions here about characters Excellent. since we are talking about them. Um, among our party, who is the most likely to light an objective on fire? That would definitely be Calith, who is Emily's <laughs> character. She's a, uh, a blade singer. She's an Avariel, okay? Um, winged elf, I'm sure you all know that. Her wings are huge, golden, beautiful wings. And the PCs have never, ever seen her fly, ever. They mention it at least once a session. Dying to know what is up with her and, wings, you guys. And she, she keeps saying, no, no, I don't see any reason to. She's like, I can just walk. I can just walk. Oh, I learned the feather fall spell. <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing. Like, only thing that I find interesting about D&D is that your character always, your characters have like these cool sort of secrets. Mm -hmm. and, and the way the game is shaped, it's very tempting to just always hold on to them. But figuring out like what is the best narrative place to sort of let that out or let bits of it out is really, I don't know, I think that's something we're pretty good at. Oh, yeah. And Emily is teasing this out at just exactly the right rate to drive me crazy. I'm so excited to find out oh, what it, is it, up. It will come up. And of I'm course sure. her dark secret is that uh, she has also Despite being a noble of Ariel, wizard, blade singer, she is dirt poor. She gets kicked poor. out of every library she ever enters for some reason. And it turns out that she has a, uh, a history, shall we say, of uh, libraries lighting on fire whenever she's present. So We all have our problems. Or touching uh, cursed books. That was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't touch the cursed book. Why is that hard? Um, okay, who is the most likely to ruin the DM's plans? We can come back to that one if it's too heavy. I'm not going to come back to it because we know it's so <laughs> <laughs> Remember what I was saying about Tetsuya inherently distrusting every NPC that she encountered? That can be difficult to, uh, to handle as a DM. So um, sometimes you need to introduce NPCs no. That the PCs are not intended to like or uh, trust, right? And, you know, they tell the PCs to do the thing you don't want them to do. So then the PCs go and do the thing you do want them to do. There was the early... Now, I, I told that to Aaron, but Cecilia does not know <laughs> that, that I'm, that I'm going to manipulate her that way. I'll have to steer, steer it, right? There was the, the worst Cecilia moment, I think, was early on. We had to sign the, like... The contract, the the the, the oh, charter, the adventurer's the charter. Yeah, there's an and adventurer's charter. And Cecilia's like, no, I want someone to look at this contract. <laughs> I could, I just got so at the moment. I'm like, she went to right. sign it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I'm like, why I had it, I that? had it printed out too. <laughs> like I had the paper, and it had numerous other signatures of previous signatories. <laughs> on the paper i'll i'll share a copy of it at some point you can all check out the adventurous charter that the westgate irregulars are uh are formed under because you need a charter in order to operate legally as an adventuring party otherwise the guards will assume that you are illegal sell swords of bandits and either kill you or throw you in prison so um let's just why is this the case it. Why is this the case? Not because Westgate is some noble, lawful organization like Cormier, for instance, but because you can get money out of it. So there you go. Yeah. All right. Who is the most likely to befriend? I'm going to say the direwolf because I can never pronounce the comment. The Baphomet. Baphomet. That guy. Well, uh, the one most likely to befriend Baphomet is clearly Sturge, because there's nothing that guy would not do for power. But the one most likely to befriend the direwolf is the whole damn party. 
Now, a couple of you already have befriended a wolf, and that's going to come up in the game. So I, I don't want to spoil that too much, but there is a wolf a involved. Present. Yeah. It was a present. From somebody. The kind, of, the kind of present that's a good Unrelated. present. Unrelated. Maybe? Uh. <laughs> um, but yeah, all of, all of you have this great inclination to make friends with the creatures or uh, sympathize with the, with the NPCs that don't expect to sympathize with, which I, I really enjoy. Like that, that pushes the game in really interesting directions. Except for Sturge. Sturge will kill any monster unless it can offer him power like Baphomet. <laughs> okay, who is most likely to roll to seduce the catfish? Oh, well, now let me tell you a thing about Rogar. <laughs> Rogar is an unlikely romantic lead in this game. <laughs> he is a dwarf who serves Shirin Lar, who he sees as a goddess of love and beauty. Uh, now that that might be like her emphasis. That that might be, you know, but that's how he sees his faith. I think it's nice because he's sort of taken this thing past like what's the entry on the face of pantheons and gone like, well, what is a personal worship? Exactly. Sure in like? And that's very much a realm's thing. Everyone worships the gods in different ways. Everyone in the realms worships multiple deities and different aspects of those deities. Shar is incredibly popular as a deity, not because a lot of people in the realms are evil. I mean, they are, but that's not my point. No. Um, <laughs> it's because a lot of people in the realms have lost things and have been sad and despairing, and that's why Shar is so powerful, and that's why she will destroy you in the end of the... Uh, okay, we digress. Um, <laughs> so Rogar is a dwarven cleric of this goddess of love and beauty who is on a, a divine mission against... Well, I'll let him tell you about all of that when you when you interview him. Bonkers. But in he the best way. he always finds himself in these kind of pseudo flirtatious uh, moments with various NPCs because he's he's very charismatic and he's he's obviously a very good, empathetic, compassionate person. And I think that he is the most likely to end up rolling a seduction check without intending to. Like, he'd go, <laughs> he'd go into that situation going, I'm just going to talk to this one, and it's going to be fine. I can't, I can't do the accent. Yeah. Randy, Randy does the accent so well. excellent Scottish accent that is... I, I'm Dwarvish so accent. You're right. Dwarvish, Dwarvish accent. But yeah, Scottish <laughs> accent. Wait, okay, I hope Randy can do this, because I would love to talk to him about his accents, because they're... They're it's killer. A, it's stupid. It's easy. Yeah. Uh, he also has an alternate dwarf character who's, um, <laughs> whose name is Dieter. <laughs> Dieter is a, uh, is a bard. And so if we're including sub characters, Dieter is the one who is most likely to seduce the cat. That is accurate. Yeah. Dieter came in when we did, we did kind of, we ended our arc. And so over the summer we played some, um, outside of the main story while we started to get things together to do this stream for Gen Con. Um, and so... Well, and part of it is that I had killed Rogar. <laughs> like, he, he, dead. he actually did die. Oops. Uh, and Randy had to, had to give it some thought to see... Is this what you uh, want to stick with? Is, is this what I want to stick with? How do I want my character to evolve from this? And he, so he played Dieter in the meantime. Dieter was the tutor of, um, Remzi Crownsilver, who was my alternate character because Silly was busy doing things in the fake wild. Um... He was available. I don't know if that and was the best choice. And Ramsey Crown Silver. <laughs> Ramsey Crown Silver probably sounds familiar to some of you uh, Brimstone Angels fans. Yes, I'm hoping so. Assuming you've gotten that far in the series. <laughs> Assuming you've gotten Otherwise, that far in the series. Sorry, we're not going to spoil things. Just that's that's a name that's going to be relevant. Okay. Anyway, so okay. yeah, like little insertions like that from our from our works will show up in the game from time to time. And, you know, I, I think that's great. Someone did ask if there are Brimstone Angels NPCs planned, but I don't know if, I don't know about that. But maybe. Maybe. The thing is that Erin can be a little exacting about <laughs> how her characters show up and how themes that she has dealt with in her books show up. Don't so, put Farida in something and tell me she's a femme fatale. Right. That's all I'm saying. No, yeah, but, but Farida, think, definitely not. Are you sure the coloring sheets? These are the Idol Champions coloring sheets. This is uh, Farida. Does, does she look like a femme fatale? No, I'll let I'll let Fox and Twilight do that. It's fine. Yes, Fox and Twilight, femme fatale. Farida. Exactly. Um, 
But we did talk briefly about uh, whether if you bring Harpers into it, you might include Cochen, who is the Westgate yeah. Harper spymaster from uh, Adversary. That's very possible. And considering how much intrigue is going to happen in the campaign, that's quite likely. And I'll be consulting with you very deeply about that because, you know, that's your character. I think, I think she's up your alley. Too. And the thing is, um, when I am going to do events for the characters and character development, I am going to make sure that I consult deeply with the particular player because I don't, the whole, the point of the stream is partly to surprise you and improvise a game, but also partly to develop things that you think are interesting because again, we're all writers. Not all of us are improvisational writers. Yeah. You know, we don't get up and just tell stories. That's right. So, um, uh, Aaron and I, for instance, talk very uh, in some detail about the ending to our little first arc of the campaign, which saw Cecilia whisked off by her uh, friend, 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 friend. Uh, very powerful Fay. Who, who friend. is? I'm going to say this wrong, and Mark Sastet is going to come hunt me down. Yes. Piranha watch you, watch you, the Piranha heart of the watch piercing. You. The heart of the piercing. She met her once. Sorry, it's Mark. It's all good. It's definitely. <laughs> She's basically she, she rose here. out of a pool of blood. Uh, it, was a, it was a whole thing. <laughs> All right, I have one more. Who is most likely to cast magic missile at the darkness? Artemisia. <laughs> Not because it's dark, but because there might be something gross in that darkness. Gross. And Artemisia has a whole thing about not being dirty. <laughs> When they venture into the sewers or into a cavern, Artemisia is its constantly fighting this rising level of anxiety that will eventually overtake her and she will disappear and uh, turn into a small ring. Yes, like a, like a ring you wear on your finger. And she, had, she never has any memory of this happening, but everyone else has witnessed it happen. The, uh, mm. still don't know what that's about. It's also a good mechanism if Rhiannon has to leave early, which she frequently does. Someone pointed out that Lorcan is the femme fatale, and I like that. That's much more accurate. Lorcan oh. is the femme masculine fatale, yes. <laughs> I mean, there's a little masculine Lorcan. Just a smidge. <laughs> just, just a smidge. Just a smidge. Just a, just a smidge in the in <laughs> form of, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. All right. So now maybe, maybe Lorcan has to. Oh my god! I don't. It, I played in a mm. in a game once where I had to be Lorcan, and it was hard. It was hard. Yes. It was embarrassing, and probably it was for for the children. It was for charity, and I also it was um the extra life game that Wizards used to put on. Sorry, I didn't realize I knocked on the table. The whole thing would shake. Um, it was the extra life game that was <laughs> that was quite ah! crazy. That I used to, that I used to get, where they would put on, and so they had things where you could bid to make things happen to characters. Mm -hmm. And Rodney Thompson had oh gotten God. a thing that for an hour he was in love with whoever was sitting on his left. Oh no! And so <laughs> when that hour started, I made someone switch seats with me because <laughs> it's like I don't want to do this. It's going to be really embarrassing, but it's I have to do it for the story. Because it was acting, it was just what Lorcan would do. So. Rodney is one of our mutual friends, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, no, I'm, well, you know, it is possible that Lorcan could be attached to the story. Like, we don't really know where Mirabelle came from. Oh, no. No. She's saying. a demon. She's a demon, isn't she? We found her in the abyss. Maybe. Maybe. That would make me so uncomfortable. I would be so uncomfortable. <laughs> Ooh. I don't want to, I don't know, oh. hard pass. Okay. Where's my X card? That's the thing. In our game, <laughs> we are going to have X cards. And if there's something that a player just does not want to have happen, it just does not happen. <laughs> and that is fine. Writers edit, you know? Yep. And if your editor is like, dude, don't do this, hot dog in a hallway. You're never you going to let me forget that. You were never going to let me forget that. <laughs> Okay, let me see. I am never going to let her forget that. That's an inside joke. Okay, let me go see. Let me see if there's any um, questions, and then we'll, we can do more silly questions, too. Okay. 
perspective on this is kind of funny. I look like I'm like smaller than you, even though I'm like three <laughs> times Aaron's size. I should have been writing these down as they popped. Okay, so what day, time, and app? Oh, and Yang Yang answered that. We're going to play on Wednesdays uh, at Wednesday. 6.30. I thought it was 7. Okay, uh, 6. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, okay, it's, it's going to be 6.30 or 7. We're still working out the exact <laughs> And our launch date is supposed to be January 8th. That, on Twitch, on uh, Gen Con's Twitch That's right. channel, mm -hmm. which I should have typed into here. Okay, uh, na, 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 na. and it's two hours. Someone asked what the session length is, so they're two hour games. They might be. They might stretch to two and a half hours, that's but fair. that's the kind of basic uh, timeline I'm looking at. Oh, see, Yang Yang is answering these questions. Yang Yang knows what he's talking Sorry, about. Sorry, Yang Yang. He's the heart and soul of the group, clearly, or at least the brains of the group. Nick Kimball loves us. Oh, that's that's nice. Thank you, Nick. Uh, uh, some people have games at the same time. But you know what? They will you be able to watch them afterwards. That's right. Uh, the videos uh, should be streamed live, and they will also be recorded and then released uh, to be viewed afterward. I right? see. I see a theory that the reason Kayla doesn't fly is she's scared of heights. Which okay, <laughs> so delightful. there was a moment when um, I was using the uh, the rules for the DMG for passing time right between adventures downtime. And she decided to go carousing. <laughs> and the thing that happened, she rolled for carousing and ended up drunk. <laughs> and I said, okay, you find yourself in a tree on the main thoroughfare. Oh, wait, I kind of remember this. Like, we, the next day she was in a tree and we're like, how do we get her down? Yeah. <laughs> she wouldn't flat down. She's kind of like a cat in that tree, not like a bird in that tree at all. So... Uh, what made us decide to get together to, we, we kind of talked about that early on, so you might want to scroll back. Someone asked for a Tenora cameo. We are not in Waterdeep, unfortunately. I don't think Tenora comes to Westgate. Yes, Crown Silver. Da, da, da. So just to be clear, we haven't spoiled anything that we've done already. Like, we'll kind of recap in the game, but there's new That's stuff. That's right. We have so much. I, this is like for better or worse. Every one of us is like has like a novel's worth of story in our heads. Mm -hmm. so. so these characters are like a, a group of friends. They're not meeting for the first time. Okay, <laughs> friends, friends by discretion. That's they're, not true. They're a group of people who know each other pretty well <laughs> and work together frequently. So they're a group of coworkers, right? There you go. And uh, they have a, a great deal of shared backstory. And uh, some of that backstory will be will come up in the game. Some of it will just be small references. We uh, we did record a bunch of our earlier sessions. They uh, they lack the polish and 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 they're 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 bad. But <laughs> they are fun and delightful. They're fun and delightful. Our equipment is not amazing. Yeah, we uh, we might be uh, making those available for people to watch at some point. Uh, there was a period of time when our very first session showed up on YouTube for about three days or something. And then we Which said, some oh, of you might have seen it. Yeah, like, some of you might have seen it. It's reviews possible. It's for possible. just being thrown up on YouTube accidentally. The, my favorite joke from that came when they tried to take um, Stong's uh, adopted daughter, Mirabelle, into the Purple Lady. And the bouncer <laughs> said, is that a three-year-old child? And the paladin at the time piped up and said, no, that is a two-year-old child. <laughs> And then oh. the bouncer just waved them through. <laughs> what are you going to say to that? Yeah, well, nothing when your charisma check is that high. Fair point. All right, so here's, okay. here's some, like, what is the weirdest realms fact that you have encountered researching for various projects? Ooh, the weirdest realms Or like realms that fact. fun little bit of weird trivia. You mean other than the whole spell plague thing having happened? Mm. <laughs> um, no, the realms is full of just odd, odd little things. Um, some of the stuff I, I researched about Netheril going into writing uh, Depths of Madness, if anyone has read that book, I did some really yeah, yeah. weird, really weird stuff in that book. There's a, there's a lawful neutral Sharn in that book. It's very strange. <laughs> All right. But um, some of that stuff was, was really, uh, really odd. And I, I, I liked the, the the magic and the politics and stuff that I was reading about, and I, I turned that into creating my own uh, floating city, which 
in my conception, clearly made sense to be an upside down floating city. <laughs> so they carved the top off the mountain, with that 10th level spell that does that, flipped it over, built the city on top, cast another reverse gravity spell to flip it back over, and then it became kind of like an eccentric, weird city in the Empire of Netheril. So that is the weirdest <laughs> piece of <laughs> canon that I have contributed to the realms, which is based on canon that I researched when reading about Netheril. So, have you ever gotten, um, like, you ask Ed a question? Oh, and I ask Ed you, questions all the time. Said, so what happens when you ask Ed a question is Ed sends you the answers to every related question you could possibly have. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, do you have, have, have you ever gotten a weird little tidbit that way that maybe people don't know? Well, there was a time when I was running um, a campaign. Um, I call it my gamer campaign because it was me, tall, straight dude, and six gay dudes sitting around the table. And it was fabulous. It was this great game. <laughs> and and they, they're uninhibited and coming up with, with awesome stuff. And one of the questions that they asked was, so what are sex toys like in the realms? And I said, you know, I'll send an email to Ed and I'll get back to you about that next week. <laughs> Sure enough, no. 12 or 14 pages later. That, I bet uh, that's very detailed. The one that, the one that mostly hung around was um, dagger hilts and pommels. That seems very dangerous. Well, you see, you, you <laughs> stab the dagger into like a, like a log or a stump. Okay. Much safer. I guess the blade is taken care of at that point. Mm -hmm. I was going to say a thing about giant moths, but I don't think I could follow that. Um, so true, true, true realms lore straight from red. <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, okay, realms is a great big place. True. And you, you know, even if you write, you know, eight hundred books in it, there's still new spaces. Which some people have. Yeah. What in the realms would you love to write about or bring into this into a game or something they haven't yet? Something. Oh wow! Something that I haven't written about the realms yet. <laughs> But would really like to. Huh. Well, obviously I want to write Shadow Bane 4, but that's you that's somewhere in, the, <laughs> somewhere in the future. Whatever. Okay, sure. But um, back in the uh, late 3rd edition, before 4th edition days, I was going to write a follow-up to Ghostwalker. For those of you who have read Ghostwalker, it came out in 2005. It was a long time ago, before some of you were born. I'm just, just kidding. I'm not that old. Oh my I'm not God. that old. The, 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 oh. Oh. <laughs> I, I said that to evoke that reaction. Um, I was going to write a follow-up to Ghostwalker, and it was going to be a, uh, a sweeping epic about war in the Northlands between various factions and an invading horde of orcs. And then Bob wrote that novel. So... <laughs> Uh, and, and a game <laughs> supplement that came out shortly thereafter, uh, which sort of matched what Bob said, but yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> so that, that never happened, but I really wanted to write a war epic in the realms and, and look at the various effects that war has on the characters because, um, so much of my writing is, is, is small and personal and, and you know, the, the individual quests that people go on. And I wanted to just kind of create something really big. But, you know, I'm happy writing small personal stories too. I'm, I'm really good at <laughs> that kind of focus. Yeah. I find that sweeping, like, battle thing, it's, when it's done well, it's really great. And it, and it, it it's, I find it so daunting because how do you, make something that is such a big scope that still resonates for a reader who very likely has not been in that experience, but right. it's really cool when it's done well. Right. Um, I mean, I was also 21 years old and an idiot, so <laughs> I thought I could do it. <laughs> and I, I could do it now. I'm not sure I could have done it then. So thank you, Bob, is what I'm saying. <laughs> That's interesting. I was listening. I was there's something going around Twitter talking about like you know when do you are there books that this is no I didn't write this down so we'll see if this turns into a question you know are there books that you um, want to write that you are kind of saving for a point where your craft improves to oh, when yes. you can write them oh yeah definitely there are a couple of books that I've thought up um, 
years ago. One I came up with while I was in college, which 16 years ago. Um, Why does that keep happening? And I said to myself, don't write this book yet. You don't know enough. You are not skilled or polished enough to pull this off. And I'm getting there. I'm almost there. I figure when I'm 40, I'll let myself write this book. Yeah. Got things to look forward to. It keeps evolving too. Like the longer I leave it, you know, simmering on the back burner, the, the more developed and better it gets. Because um, for me, at least, I don't know if every writer is like this. Maybe you have this. Um, I sometimes come up with a really strong, vivid idea. Mm-hmm. And it's usually a premise for a story that I really, really want to tell. And I, like, I lose sleep thinking about how much mm-hmm. I want to tell this story. I, I, I can't work on things I'm supposed to work on because I'm like, okay, start writing the book that you want to write. Start writing the book that you want to write. And I, I got to keep telling myself, no, you need to give it more time. You need to keep, you need to let it cook for a while. That's right. It's like a, like a pig. It's going to be buried <laughs> under, under the sand. <laughs> I have some Owen cousins. Okay. I, u- I use these analogies periodically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always find when people talk about, you know, starting with an idea that I don't, I never, I'm always like, oh, I don't have. Because they don't tend to have that sort of hooky concept. I tend to take like little partial ideas and build them together until they turn into like a nice mm-hmm. stable mm-hmm. thing. But yeah, I, I, I often come up with like like scenes and I don't know how they fit together. So I, <laughs> I, like, I like arrange them and then I uh, splice them together with connective tissue. So the, uh, oh, here's a question. I was going to ask what you're working on now. Like, are you writing anything right now? Are you shopping anything around right now? that you want to talk about, or is it all simmering and cooking in? Uh, the answer is yes. I am writing something right now. I am editing something right now. I am shopping around something right now. I'm a little less shopping around something right now. Like I have a, an agent looking at some things and I'm like, okay, I'll wait until that agent gets back to me. <laughs> and then, I'll, <laughs> then, I'll, then I'll query other people if that agent says no. Um, but Agents are weird. I am editing. They're wonderful wonderful and weird and difficult and writing writing is a <laughs> difficult path okay we can talk about that later yeah um let's stay uppy uh i'm writing i'm editing the world of ruin number four which is my last book in the series for now at least for those of you who haven't read uh the world of ruin series is kind of a post-apocalyptic fantasy series uh it's like i describe it to people as game of thrones meets fallouts uh, there was this magical apocalypse that swept over the world. The only people that survived uh, did so in underground uh, castles following the prophecy of return, which was how long they would have to wait until the world would be habitable again. But some people emerged a little too early <laughs> and were tainted by the still active magical radiation, became these horrible barbarians who roamed the land just trying to kill everything they can find. Um, it's this got, trip advisor post is terrible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't visit any of my worlds. <laughs> they are not welcoming. Uh, yeah, it's got um, like Magitech stuff, sky ships, uh, crossbow, magical crossbow guns, um, all sorts of stuff. It's pretty cool. Oh, cool. It's it's more Final Fantasy than D and D, right? So someone, uh, Jeremy Watson asks, uh, "What is the best fantasy series that either of us have read?" Oh my. Gosh, that's that's a daunting question. Oh my gosh, I think the the longest one I have read most all of the books for Why? is um <laughs> aside <laughs> from the realms, right? That I feel like we have to set that one over here. That's like, a, that's our constant that's caveat. The, yeah, because we we love the realms. <laughs> yes, we're all good with that. Yes, okay, good. The um uh what is it called? Naomi Novik's His Majesty's Dragon. Oh yeah, that sounds, I liked that, that one, right. and I and that was one where like I kept, I kept up with it and read all of them. And I feel like that deserves a mention. Um, it's a little different, right? It's not as it's it's sort of historical fantasy. It's Napoleonic Wars. If everybody had dragons, um, and the dragons are kind of delightful. So I was kind of a slow Napoleonic convert Wars not, but. to certain very popular series. Um, I only recently read through the, uh, the Dresden Files, for instance, which is a pretty solid and very classic urban fantasy sort of story. Um, 
I don't think that's really my favorite though. I'm, I'm trying to pin down what, what my are, best, you know, the best one I ever read was. I read the Witcher books. Those were pretty good from a particular, uh, particular perspective. I highly encourage you to read the books in addition to playing the games. They're different and uh, bring good stuff to the table. Plus there's a show coming out. So, you know, read the books. I find too that like this, this sort of question with my kid, like if you ask Tiny Mr. I, like what is your favorite? You just like, you can't answer that question. Mm -hmm. You say, what is something you like? It's mm -hmm. a little easier and then you can like in. I like to phrase it as, tell me about a thing that you like. There you go. Rather than, what's your favorite or what's one that you like? Because then, <laughs> then they don't. It, it doesn't sound judgmental. It sounds like, tell me about something that interests you. Yeah. Let's see, uh, what race or class do you find the most difficult to create? Mm, halflings, definitely. I don't see things That's from that perspective. <laughs> I am six foot seven, okay? Neither of those is a measure that can work for a halfling. <laughs> like, six and seven are numbers that don't fit in the halfling range of height. You're usually like four, five, you know, three, <laughs> three, five, something like that. You're really short, three, six, half. Yeah. Yeah, I could be two halflings in a trench coat. That is a thing that could happen. <laughs> That's delightful. Um, I, you know what's funny? I have never created a wizard because I find the way wizards cast spells, I just go, what? Too much bookkeeping? Um, I guess so. I just mm. There's something about it that, that irritates me on a fundamental level. And I feel like I could get over it, but I just play other casters like sorcerers and warlocks and definitely not warlocks. I definitely not warlocks. She's definitely not playing a warlock in this game. Definitely not. Um, sure. I have never played a sorcerer. Really? Yeah. I like the concept of sorcerers. I think it's really neat, but I've never found myself playing one for whatever reason. I, I think it's a lot because I, I end up DMing a lot of the time. That's fair. Um, but yeah, I think I played every other class. I just haven't played a sorcerer. I was sort of disappointed that Rhiannon, I mean, not... Like, disappointed from distance, because it's not my character. But Rhiannon, when Rhiannon was choosing what kind of sorcerer she wanted to play, she did not pick the wild magic sorcerer with oh the table. God. Like... Oh. <laughs> wild magic is great. Percentile tables are so dangerous, and I love them. Oh, I should talk about a couple of the charts that I created oh for the God. game. So, in 5th edition, a natural one on your attack roll is not a not a critical fumble or anything, right? That would be unreasonably punishing, particularly for people who have multiple attacks. Like you would imagine a 20th level fighter who's got four attacks now has a you know 400% chance of fumbling versus a first level wizard with one attack, mm -hmm. right? Because anyone can roll one, you have a 5% chance of rolling one. So I created a table called the fumble chart, where someone rolls a one, and I roll on the fumble chart to see an interesting thing that happens. It might be good, it might be bad, it might be, you know, just kind of developing the encounter a little bit. The one who's had the least luck with it is Steven, rolling with Surge, because every time he rolls a one, he rolls on the fumble chart and he rolls a three, which is accidentally hit yourself with your own weapon. <laughs> The chances of that happening are infinitesimal, but it happens to me every time. We should get Steven new dice. We I don't should. think they're very nice to him. We Although should. he got new ones last time, but he's not superstitious about his dice either, so he's I also, like, they'll come around. Yeah, I also created a thing called the splatter chart. In the splatter chart, the concept is that when you kill an enemy, you can either narrate what happens, or you can roll on the splatter chart, and that will tell you what happens. <laughs> depending on the type of damage you use to kill the enemy. Um, and uh, some of them are very straightforward, like you'd expect in a fantasy story, and some of them are straight up Mortal Kombat inspired. So <laughs> the higher you roll, the gorier it tends to be. I've not seen any of those. Oh. Yet. Oh. Let's see, we got, what is your opinion of working with another author? Co-writing, is there someone you want to work with? I have co-written several things before. Yeah? And it is really fun. Yeah. I, I like having the alternative perspectives and I like having someone to bounce ideas off of who is as involved with the story as I am. Um, who would I like to write with? Well, there was a time when I was 22 and stupid that I really wanted to write this one particular story with Bob Salvatore, but uh, like I said, busy. 22 <laughs> and stupid and he was very busy. Um, 
but you know, that'd be exciting though. Like a lot of writers that I really like, I would like to write something with, collaborate with, or um, write related stories with. Um, for instance, if in our game we were to write an anthology about mm -hmm. our characters or our adventures. I think that would be really fun. We yeah. could all compare notes and stories and who knows? Just thank you for that idea, by the way. That was a good idea. Super popular. Right. And then wizards will say, what a great idea. And yeah. we can do it. Just yeah. you watch our stream at seven on Wednesday, starting January 8th. That's right. And that will help. That's right. Um, so someone asked, have you ever read about an item that grabbed your imagination? For me lately, it was Imara's Scrying Stones. Do you like items? I do like items. My philosophy as regards items as a DM is that I like to give items to characters and not explain what they are right away. That happens a lot, you guys. Okay. I, you know, sometimes you'll find an item that you see the kind of superficial base level concepts and what it does. Like, we were talking earlier about Artemisia's Ring. Um, Artemisia's ring is just a simple ring of protection. It increases her AC and her saving throws. Basic. But eventually it was revealed that when she reaches a certain level of anxiety, she poof disappears and becomes just that ring. And so somebody better pick up the ring if you want Artemisia to be around in the next nope. adventure. Otherwise she's going to wake up in the last place that you were, not knowing what happened. Frequently the sewers. I don't, I don't know why that keeps sewers. happening. What skate needs to send someone down there and fix well, it? Yeah. I guess that's us. Yeah, but... that, that is you, unfortunately. <laughs> there's, you see, the problem is there's not a lot of money in sewer maintenance. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Fair point. Um, let's see. Kelly asks, what class and race haven't you played? Well, we already talked about the Halfling Sorcerer. So oh, that's right. You did mention that. I forgot that. Let's, uh, let's go to the second least likely one, and I think it's got to be the... Yeah, it's got to be a gnome druid. Mm, interesting. I like druids. Mr. I likes druids a lot. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with gnomes. <laughs> but <laughs> I've never, I've never seen them. I've never even seen someone play a gnome druid, let alone play one myself. Interesting. Um, I think it would be neat. Um, I have seen a halfling druid, and when he turns into a giant crocodile, it's really freaky. And, and great. We keep pressuring him to turn into an octopus. Because he's like a, like a coastal druid, and the DM keeps reminding us, this is in a different game than I'm in. The DM keeps reminding us, you're on solid ground right now. There is no water around. Octopi do not breathe air. And we're like, yeah, you're right. I don't know, man. They escape their cave, their their tanks and run yeah, away. Yeah, they their so. breath. Do you all know about that story? There's an octopus. It was a Seattle Aquarium, right? I think so. Yeah. I feel like it's happened more than once in different places. So though. there was this there was this fish tank that kept going empty of fish and they couldn't figure out what was going on. Like the the fish the just fish died with no vanishing. they just vanished overnight. And so they finally set up a security camera and what the security camera captured was this octopus from another tank would climb out of its own tank, find a way to get through the, the security measure or door or just push it open slither across to the other tank, eat all the fish, and then go and back then go into home. its own tank overnight. <laughs> it's like, this restaurant is amazing. Yes, it is remarkable. All right, let's see. We got I'm not saying something like that will happen in the game, but I'm not saying it won't. Uh, if you could throw caution and good sense to the wind to play a character or write a story as far as possible away from the proverbial beaten path, wow. what would it be? That's a deep question. Deep question. I started working on a story which has um, seven. This makes sense. It will make sense when it's done. It has seven points of view, and each uh -huh. one is in a different um, tense. <laughs> <laughs> oh we'll see. Each one is works. in a different. There are seven sort tenses. Of. Well, okay. Okay. So there's okay. one. It's. Okay. it's it's um sorry it's first person pass and then it's a third person distant okay and then it's a uh, first person present uh -huh. and uh -huh. then there's a uh third uh, a limited on so an omniscient except there's one point of view it can't touch 
And then there's a uh, so what you, letters. What do you mean? Is there are seven different perspectives? Perspectives, but I don't want to say perspectives because then it's sort of yeah, just right. Because like, then it's like yeah. seven different characters You're right. telling stories. So right. So it's like seven different um, storytelling paradigms. <laughs> there you Basically, go. but it's based on the uh, Egyptian soul's seven parts. So each one is tailored around that part. So we'll see if it works. The trick. That is the weirdest thing. That is most like someone's going to tell you not to do it that I want to do. I And I think I'm good enough. When to do I come it up now. with ideas like that, I tend to actually do them. That's it. See? And I, I I don't necessarily publish them, right? But they are around, so we'll see. Let's see what we got. Fumble. They love your fumble chart. Thank you. Yang Yang is very superstitious about his dice. I am true. hoping to put the fumble chart on the DM's guild for a tiny tiny fee, like a 99 cent item or something. It's way worth it. It's real fun. Okay, I think we've gotten all up all the questions. So nice. if anybody has any others they want to type out real quick, we can answer them. But we have been going for about an hour. Yeah. And that you just came here right from my house from work. That's so true. you might I, be I like did. a little ready to go. <laughs> I am very tired. It's true. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank okay. you, Erin. Yeah, thanks thank, for coming. Thank, thank you, guys. For, for showing and, and listening couple to new us. Ones. Ever had any experience with a character with multiple personalities or an other mental challenge that was a hero? Interesting. <laughs> uh, now, now we're talking about one of the other games that I'm running right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, challenging. Sometimes, um, okay. So when a character, when you want a character to have a personality challenge or, or a serious um, ailment, uh, psychological distress of some kind, it's always a good idea to talk with the player to make sure that they're on board with this. You don't necessarily want to spring, your character has multiple personality disorder, you are insane, rah, on them just out of the blue. That's not, that's not respectful, it's not very good for your game overall. But if I were to do something with that, like that with a player, which I have done many times in the past, I would approach that player beforehand and say, hey, I want to do this thing with your character. And I might, I might only describe it in kind of general terms and then ask, do you trust me to take you on this journey with you as a player? And if they say yes, great, we do it. And if they say no, then I say, okay, well, let me explain my idea a little bit more. And if you still say no, it's still no. And if they still say no, it's definitely a no. So yes, I have done that. Yes, you should do that, but you should do it in consultation with the player. Sounds like a good plan. Okay, so we are all cut up. So that's gonna end it. Um, we will have more of these with the other players. I don't know who's gonna be next, but I know Rhiannon is very excited, so I might grab her. That'd be really um, cool. She's got good things to say. Yes, and, and uh, she's been willing to take a Realms Facts quiz because this is her first experience with Forgotten Realms. This and she's read a couple of the Brimstone Angels books because excellent. Because I, I <laughs> it's because complicated. You, and I'll you, ask. I'll you, ask her you push, about you it. push them toward her. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> just like, hey, uh, you have something to read. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, so yes, thank you. Please watch our stream. Um, yes. One of the things about our stream is that we're looking to acquire a certain number of. Uh, concurrent viewers and so if you were actually able to watch stream that will definitely help us in continuing to stream the game yes so it's up to us to make it entertaining but we're relying on you to support us as well come give it a try January 8th mark your calendars and we'll see you guys then <laughs>